Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the second BAD on online event in 2022. My name is Catherine dupelou menager and um, I'm the Artistic Director of BAD Sydney. I'd like to begin by acknowledging traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We recognise their continuing connection to land, to waters and to culture and pay our respects to their elders past and present. I'm talking today from Camaragal land. Now we're always really excited at BAD when a fresh voice comes onto the scene. And by fresh, I mean fresh in terms of new, it's a new voice, but it's also fresh in terms of an exciting voice. And um, Danuka McKenzie meets both those criteria. I loved the torrent um, and I particularly loved the wonderful female detective. And our Danuka's got a copy of the books behind her, but I've got my very own copy here. So you can see this really fantastic cover as well. So I'm really delighted to welcome Danuka and her prize was in book, winning book to Bad Online. Welcome. Now, a good writer needs a good interlocutor. And any of you who's listened to Danny V's Words and Nerds knows that she is that and more. She interviews writers in a whole range of genres, does it inspiringly and really well. And later this year, her first book is going to be published. It's a children's picture book. So that's exciting as well. But we hope we might entice you to the dark side one day, perhaps, and we can have a crime book and we can change places. Before we start the interview, I want to thank our sponsors, the City of Sydney and Create New South Wales, um, without whom we really couldn't do this work. It's been such a difficult two years and they have been incredibly supportive. We also have a relationship with Booktopia where you can buy the books. Um, click on the link in the Q&A and there should be a link taking you directly, should take you directly to Booktopia's page. Now, I'll tell you how we'll be running the event. Um, Danuka and Danny will be talking for about 45 to 50 minutes. Danuka, um, Danny will remind you to send in questions um, via the Q&A at about the 40 minute mark, and then she'll ask them. They will both um, see the questions, but uh, Danny's in charge of asking them. I don't quite know why we run this, but that seems to work so far. Um, I'll disappear as soon as the event starts and I'll come back a couple of minutes before the end to thank our wonderful speakers. So now it's time to go to them. Danny and Danuka, over to you and I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you so much, Catherine, and I am looking forward to this too. Danuka, it's not the first time we've done this, but it's going to be a little bit different this time because I know we've talked about the book and we launched the book. But now we're going to go, I've been promising all week, we're going to go a bit deep and right on cue as for the torrent, it has started uh, to rain quite heavily. So if you can hear a bit of a sound behind my laptop, that's what it is. So I know that's happening for you too, Danuka. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's right on brand. It's very much on brand. We, we, uh, this is what I prepared for you earlier, Danny. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. But no, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this with us. It's so great that you could, um, you know, we're able to do this again. And I want to quickly thank, um, you know, Catherine and, and uh, Bad Sydney for allowing me to do this with you today. This is amazing. Thank you. They always have the best events. And, you know, as we know from the festival uh, last year, it was fantastic. And they always have the best events. So hopefully this will uh, rack up to be one of them. Now, Danuka, The Torrent is your debut novel and it won the HarperCollins Australia 22, 2020 Banjo Prize. And I'm just always so impressed by this. You also work in the environmental sector and volunteer as part of the team behind Writers Unleashed Festival. So you're right there in the industry. Now, are you ready? Are you ready to go deep, Danuka? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I'll let you know by the end of this session how ready I was. <laughs> we shall see. Yes. Now, the first question, I do want to talk about the Banjo Prize in 2020 because it's such an important prize it's such an incredible prize and I just feel like being the winner like next level amazing what do you think looking back I'm sure none of us have any idea when we enter these competitions but what do you think looking back what do you need to win the banjo prize <laughs> wow okay um look I think with the banjo what you need to know is it is very much a um like it's well it's a commercial fiction prize so I guess in terms of submitting to the banjo you would need to um, you need to know 
you know, what commercial fiction is, which is very much, I guess, that page turning, you know, um, you know, I think character driven, you know, the setting and the plot and, you know, all of that being quite tight. But I think if you had to kind of narrow it down, I would say, you know, if you have an unpublished manuscript that sort of is commercial fiction, which I, I guess you would say, you know, crime or romance or historical fiction or all those kind of great things that people just want to read through the night, you know, uh, if, if you've got a kind of that kind of story that's just, you know, uh, you just want to tell, I think this is a perfect place for uh, that kind of manuscript and certainly you know in saying that obviously when I submitted it I had no idea that uh, you know I was even close but uh, yeah but certainly you know after many 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 revisions I think I'd certainly got to the point where I you know I was working on the exactly those elements which was making sure it was page uh, turning it was fast it was pacey you know all those kind of things was what I was certainly working on when I submitted it yeah and it's such a funny beast writing because like you said you had sort of no idea and then you win and writing's this thing where you you write something you think wow like this is okay and then the next day you look at it and you think oh wow this is terrible and then the next time you look at it you have absolutely no idea if it's good or bad or anywhere in between so tell me about the phone call. So when they called you, was it Anna Valdinga who called you and said, Danuka, tell me about, well, talk me through this. Yeah, it was definitely Anna. And, uh, you know, I have the great pleasure of having two phone calls with her, you know, because she called um, during the, uh, like for the shortlisting, um, as well as for, for the actual winning it. So I had the great pleasure of kind of um, chatting to her both times. And I guess when, you know, she called, when she called for the, for the win, it was, you know, it's that weird experience where you hear someone from the industry and you hear that excitement in their voice and it's for your words and it's like, like is this happening you know it just doesn't feel real you feel like you're living sort of someone else's life where I, I think that's kind of the greatest gift kind of she gave me because it was such like she was having this genuine reaction and she was sort of like quite enthusiastic she was going on and I I you, you know how much I talk like literally look at me but I could not get a word in you know because she was just talking and it was like wow this is kind of amazing you know and 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 I think that's why all writers or authors you know have that memory like they keep that memory of that first phone call that you know from an agent or a publisher or whatever they keep that such they're like they treasure it because it is you know it is that moment it is that memory that you kind of take out and uh take out when things aren't so good or you're not feeling that great about your writing uh but then you bring it out to remind yourself that oh no actually my manuscript did manage to find this publisher who believes in what I'm trying to do and is willing to champion my words. And, you know, I mean, how lucky is that? So, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was amazing. Absolutely. And I imagine a publisher's job isn't hard because there's probably a lot more manuscripts they're not taking on than they are taking on. So I can I can feel the excitement, you know, finally this is going to be great news for, for an up-and-coming author. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, yeah, you're totally right because it is, for them as well, this lovely moment that they get to kind of, because they know they're making your dreams come true. They literally know that. And, and you know, it's as great for the, the person, I guess, making the phone call as it is for the recipient, because in that one foul kind of swoop, you know, your, yeah, your publishing dreams come true. So, yeah, no, I think it's a lovely moment for <laughs> both sides. No, I feel like even though this was a debut book, I feel like there was some pressure because obviously you're involved, you know, as a volunteer with the Writers Unleashed Fe Festival, which is a fantastic festival, which I just love. So how did that feel? Was there extra pressure on you as a debut author thinking this is my book, but people know who I am, I volunteer for you know this great festival? Did you feel the weight of expectations on you? Oh, absolutely. Like after the win, yeah, absolutely. It, it, you know, after the win, it changed everything because, you know, in that one moment, uh, yes, all your publishing dreams come true, but it comes with this huge uh, level of expectation, which, you know, a prize brings, right? Because like, you cannot get away from that expectation. I mean, you know, and I put that on myself. I mean, I don't think anyone necessarily put that on me, but certainly, you know, um, there was so much, there was this kind of outpouring of overwhelming kind of generous, uh, like, you know, support and, and all these, you know, well wishes from all these people. And in my head, I'm like, you haven't read a word. <laughs> you have no idea. 
do you like that you know maybe you'll hate it you know you know because so obviously yeah because for me it was it was very much my first novel and and very much my first writing in that way you know like I I didn't have you know 10 other manuscripts that I kind of learned my craft on I didn't have a whole string of publications that that people had seen my words already and went yeah I'm you know that's why I'm supporting her right but so for me it felt absolutely it's, it was yeah it, uh completely exposing I guess in that way because it literally is the first words out there when the debut came out but you know having to meet what I felt was everyone's expectations I mean it probably wasn't you know but to me it felt that yeah absolutely yeah mm -hmm. and I guess that leads into imposter syndrome so you know you sound like you have a very real grounded life you've got kids and then you work in the environmental sector so you know you've got this kind of real life that we all have and then you're flip over doing all these interviews every night and you've got this debut book which is I see everywhere when I go into bookshops makes me so happy when I see it. I'm like oh there's Danuka and you know, you've won this amazing prize so has imposter syndrome been something that you've had to manage throughout this? Yeah I mean I think I, I would have to say the worst period was you know, I guess just before it came out and certainly when when sort of the the drafts of what do they call the advanced reader copies were going out to kind of other authors who I have on my shelves and that felt completely wrong. <laughs> uh, so I think that was the worst part, uh, you know, in terms of the, the or the worst uh, extent of imposter syndrome where I, it felt absolutely excruciating that these people were reading my books, uh, reading my words. And um, yeah, so I think I think after that stage was finished and there was, you know, this positive response, I, I kind of breathed after that. And I think um, after like it going out, I think I was much calmer, certainly post Christmas <laughs> after that. Um, and I also, you know, like I also have to remember that you know like you know where I have something to compare it with like I do have the nine to five to compare it with you know and so like I do you know even as I am stressed and worrying about all this stuff I'm still I still recognize how lucky I am to kind of get to do what I love you know like it is such a privilege to be able to be in that position to be able to do that so you know I have something to compare it with so yeah so it, it feels amazing yeah <laughs> I love that. Now, everyone loves your main protagonist. You know, I think it's really amazing to have that protagonist who is you know, competent and amazing at her job and a strong woman and she's pregnant and she's struggling with everyone's ideas of what that means for her and her career. And she's, you know, hang on a minute, it doesn't change how capable I am. So I think that's really important because life does change whether you like it or not, or the perceptions of you change rather when you become a mother, I think. And I think that's something we're always struggling with as women. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, the book's not just about motherhood, it's about a lot of things, but I know you've done a lot of interviews. So I'm going a bit of a different angle here, changing lanes a bit. And I want to ask you whether it was intentional or not, or when you look at it after you've written the book, what did you want to convey about the experience of motherhood and the perceptions of motherhood in the novel? Um, yeah, wow. Okay. So certainly kind of parenthood and motherhood are huge themes, you know, in the book. I mean, I guess exactly as you say, you know, the heart of Kate or the, you know, the, the heart of, I guess, what that portrayal of her is very much to try and centre, I guess, an everyday woman and an everyday kind of ordinary woman that you would kind of recognise, you know, everywhere in yourself, in, in the women around you. So highly competent and, and sort of juggling. Um, but I think, you know, for, for me, parenthood is that, <laughs> like that is the experience of parenthood. Like, you know, I have never <laughs> been so busy in my entire life um you know because it literally never ends you know there's always something else that you have to do there's always you know like you know while you're doing some emails for work you're still you know you'll get a notification from school oh, da, 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 it's orange day tomorrow you find an orange shirt or some crap you know like you know what I mean like it never <laughs> ends like there's always something so whilst you're doing one thing your head's on the other and then you know the play dates and the thing and then what and the, you know so it's that huge juggle and that was that was my overwhelming experience of parenthood you know and and I don't think that that was that version was realistically portrayed, I guess, on the pages. So certainly in the pages that I was reading, maybe it is, like, you know, I just haven't um, read it yet, but certainly I hadn't come across that. And, you know, and I just thought, you know, like I, I, 
I know how challenging it is for me and it still is you know it certainly was sort of more challenging when they were younger but um, it still is challenging and I just thought well what what does that look like for a police officer you know because because I guess I mean it is obviously in that profession there is a lot of issues and and you know I, I'm certainly not trying to downplay the fact that there are a lot of marriage breakdowns and there are a lot of you know certainly issues in terms of addiction and all the rest of it but there are also still families who are just trying to make it like you know but there are families who are trying to do that and and you know a lot of the police families I know are doing exactly that so I thought you know well why you know what would that look like so that's kind of where I wanted to go with her and in terms of um Sorry, I don't think I've actually answered your questions, but in terms of like, I guess, perceptions of uh, mothers, I guess that version, what, you know, what society expects of you is that, you know, once you become a mother, that should be enough. So that, that overwhelming love that you have for your children should absolutely be enough for you for the rest of your life. And, you know, the reality is it is a part of you and it's an extraordinary part of you and it gives you so much, but it doesn't make all the other stuff go away. It doesn't make your education that, you know, go away. It doesn't make your career that you've built up over the years go away. It doesn't make your creative pursuits and the other things you need go away. So, you know, for Kate, she is very much kind of still wanting to maintain the career that she's built up over the years. And, you know, I think, I guess it, it puts into you know front and center I guess that decision point that women have to make like it is an absolute stark decision point you have kids and you have to make a decision how many hours do you go back to work you know how many you know what's the childcare arrangement going to look like in terms of your financial capabilities you know what that looks like and then 12 months later you go back to work and then there's like you know, many male colleagues there who suddenly have 12 months more experience than you. You know what I mean? And, and that is a very much, that is, I mean, I would say that is very much female experience, you know, uh, which, which that same decision point is not necessarily there for men. Uh, you know, obviously not all men, but, you know, um, as a general rule. So, yeah, so there's a lot of things, there are a lot of strands that I guess I was grappling with at, the, at that time and which I just shoved in there. <laughs> I'm glad you did because I think that the experience of motherhood, I think particularly with social media is, you know, beautiful children painting beautiful pictures in long grass and making daisy chains, which I'm sure is some of our life. But putting that reality into it is really important because you don't feel alone because when you're when you were saying all of that stuff, I thought, oh, that's my life to nuka. <laughs> so, you know, I know that we're not the only people in the room who have experienced this. And so it's so nice to see that in a book and normalized because then you don't feel so alone, because I think sometimes motherhood can make you feel you know, quite alone. And before I go on to the next question, because we're going to continue down this thread, I find it very interesting. I uh, just want to remind our wonderful viewers that you can put your questions into the question and answer little box. I'm sure you can see it and you can ask Danuka anything. In fact, the more salacious, the better. I'm not sure that Danuka and I are going to be friends after this anymore. Yeah. I'm just kidding. You can ask anything you like about the book. I will pick and choose the questions. So I'll make sure it's something that you know, is a little bit different as well and maybe not too salacious because we don't want Tanuka to be too nervous. <laughs> I already said that I was going deep and here we are. We're in the deep part now. Yes. Okay, yes, okay. Absolutely. Now talking about, you know, motherhood and, and the experience and we know it's not everyone's experience. We know it's not just a female experience, but I guess predominantly it is because I think we're still grappling with the fact that, you know, you're meant to, I love the meme that says you're meant to work as if you don't have children and have children as if you don't have a job. And for many of us, that's not the case, you know, and you're juggling all these balls in the air. And, you know, sometimes it's amazing, like I said, and sometimes you're stuck in traffic crying because you're like, I can't get everything done and I don't know how to do it. But in saying that, even though life is hectic and busy and wonderful and all of those things mashed together, it's still so important in order to be a good human and a good mother to carve something out for yourself. Mm. And was writing that for you, was that you carving something out just for Danuka, just for you time? And how did you do it? And how did it make you feel? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I've spoken about this before, uh, but it was exactly that, you know, certainly when people ask me, why did you start writing? Well, it, it wasn't a writing ambition uh, so much as a finding something for myself, you know, just exactly as you said, carving that space. When when life felt incredibly overwhelming and when, when um, you know, when, when you have kids, you are absolutely forced to kind of, prior, you know, or reprioritise 
you know, what you're doing and to go, okay, well, is this worth it in the sense that, okay, well, I'm doing the nine to five, I'm really stressed out. Um, and I'm bringing that stress home, <laughs> like, what you know, like, where, you know, I, I need to find that kind of balance. And so I guess for me, it was very much writing, um, trying to find um, that space for myself. Um, and also, you know, trying to, you know, like, I guess finding a world where I could move the pieces, you know, and I could control that. And, and that felt kind of um, very freeing and very, you know, because it, there was literally no expectations on me in that space, you know, and, and I would probably say that first draft was probably the most raw kind of, you know, because it had everything, it had every single thing I'd ever thought about the world was, was in there, right? And then it, now it's been paired back and it still has quite a lot in there. Um, but yeah, because because it felt like a place where I literally had uh, no deadlines, no kind of, you know, you know, I didn't have to prove anything to anyone. I, I didn't have to be any kind of version of myself, like a mother, you know, wife, employee. Um, so yeah, so it felt like it really was for me, you know, and, and in a way I hadn't, I hadn't ever done that for me because I've done the linear thing all my life, you know, school straight to uni you know straight to work um and basically until I had kids I had never not worked you know and the only time I didn't work was when I went and did um high education and so you know it always worked and so it was literally the first time that I stopped working um and and I went oh, okay well maybe I could do something else so yeah so that's where it started yeah it's interesting because you know you say that there was no expectation on you because you're a debut author and no one sort of knew you were writing and a couple of people might have known but now that's all changed Anuka you've got the torrent amazing debut I've heard everyone raving about it because it's an, it's an amazing novel it's fantastic you've won a banjo prize so I hate to do this to you but do you feel in book two and three that now there's a little bit of expectation and a couple of deadlines and how are you feeling about that yeah so yes that is true <laughs> um yeah look I guess okay so I I would I'm I'm having that third book syndrome I guess because second book was very much written uh as a means of stress relief from book one of all the pressures of it in the sense that all the pressures I put you know on myself uh, as a result of it, as a result of banjo, and just um, every time I had to go back to the edits for that, I was like, "Oh my god, this is that book!" You know, like it's going to go out to everyone. Whereas the second book, I could escape to because no one had seen it. You know, no one knew. I mean, people knew about it in the sense that you know, I told my agent whatever, but um, you know, really, no one had seen it, and it was still mine. It was still mine to do whatever you know I wanted with it and whatever I wanted to do with those characters and no one was telling me anything about it so um so the second one was also felt like written in a very kind of natural way in that, in that sense because I didn't um I mean in saying that I, I obviously took in a, all the lessons that I'd learned through the edits and the, the never-ending edits for the, for the for the first one you know and the revision so so I, I felt that once I'd finished the second one it was in a far better place as a first draft than the first draft of, of you know the, the manuscript that became the torrent so um yeah so but now absolutely just exactly as you said uh third book syndrome is yeah <laughs> because everyone knows about it and it's like okay, they just stress you out to do car <laughs> no and i've got a year to do it and i'm like yep yeah i mean i hope my is, is my publisher part of this Zoom meeting because i've written about a thousand words anyway yeah what was that 10 20, words? yeah no that's right Fifteen thousand words yeah, right. no. <laughs> yeah exactly but yeah so i think the third one is taking a longer time to stew as well because i think the second one was like like I absolutely knew straight away what I wanted to do like the minute I finished the um you know the I mean I still want to call it the old manuscript name but anyway when you know the when I finished that manuscript I was like immediately onto the second one because I knew exactly where her story was going uh whereas you know the the third one in my mind at least at this stage given that I've only written a thousand words it could change but you know at this stage anyway it's a, it's a few more months you know past so uh it feels like okay where where is she now? Where is the family now? And and um, let let's uh, let's see where the story goes. So I'm still kind of working that out, and also um, yeah, 
Mm. And I think it must be, there must be some relief in knowing the characters. You don't have to develop a whole new character. However, I guess then there's that added pressure of, well, she has to grow and develop and she has to have this sort of character arc over three or maybe more books. So how are you feeling about that character in, in sort of making her develop over three books? How is that going? Yeah, look, I mean, um, again, I don't know how much I should be talking about this, but certainly in my idea, I very uh, in my head, excuse me, I had a, a very clear idea that um, I guess the first book was very much about Kate. Um, the second book, you know, very much focuses on Kate's relationship with her dad. And then the, the third book, I, in my head, I was like, it had to be something to do with her brother. So that's kind of the three arcs that I always kind of felt that I, that overarching thing that I always had in my head. So, I mean, that's really where I got to with that. But, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, what, one of the things I guess, uh, which was great about, I guess creating that world was for me like it was you know it was it was a playground I mean I, I just I just created it right and but what what I've left with was you know she has all her police characters she has a family you know and then obviously whoever we're going to meet in terms of the the crime right so there's all these angles that I, I can always play off you know so um for me I'm never so much worried about <laughs> how many things how many threads they're going to be it's just more trying to make sure that they're cohesive and, and and you know there's still that mystery right because I mean like one of the great things is is about detective fiction uh, and particularly series is where you can come back to that world and, and find something new you know and, and it's a huge privilege that you know that this series could be that thing for, for other readers which you know I mean I, I just that blows my mind because that's what I love about crime fiction so the fact that you know to think that I could kind of potentially create that world for someone else to kind mm. of keep coming back to that's actually kind of quite cool yeah. so I'm actually quite protective of it in that way like you know like you feel like oh shit like I really have to make it work because yeah. if, if it is something that people love like yeah you got to respect that yeah now I know you said you've only written a thousand words and I this isn't a cop-out for writers but I often think part of the process is having it in your head hmm. and you know being in traffic or in the shower and just going through the characters or just allowing it to sort of you know percolate in your brain and I know that when I've been asked to write something like believe me when I say this this is part of the process I know it looks like I'm not doing anything but the thinking is actually doing something because then you can get to the page faster and you can start to write down more cohesive ideas. Do you find that that's what's happening with you with this third book? I mean, you say you haven't written a lot, but it seems like you've thought about it a lot. So is a lot going on in your head and when you go to the page, you're going, okay, I've done all that thinking. Now I can go and write the pages with a bit more ease or less pain? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Now you that's totally, you know, that's completely right because um, so obviously, you know, to, to I guess get that, the, the third book deal um, I had to put some sort of storyline together uh, you know and and you know and it's already kind of like I'm thinking oh no but I can do this and I can do that so yeah so there's always those threads that you're constantly working on and I find actually I do this just when I'm about to go to sleep sort of you know when you like you've read the book and you you're just drowsy and then I force my mind to go to that new story and that and and sort of a scene will come and I will just let it sit there so I won't like then get up and like type it on my phone or whatever but then that and and I often would come back to that scene sort of quite a few nights you know if you know what I mean until you know and then when I come to write you know, yeah it, it is kind of there already and few, a little bit of the dialogue is there particularly because it, certainly in this case I'm still trying to feel my way into the story so um I think when you're in the story, it kind of flows much quicker, but I am still absolutely trying to feel my way through the story. And, and certainly that first chapter, I okay, well, where is this story going to start? You know? uh, and I have a number of ideas and I've, and I've actually written that out numerous times and I've gone, oh, no, you know, but, but, but I'm telling myself that story because I'm telling myself what's happening in that day. And I'm still working out where in that day that, you know, that chapter is going to start. But I need to write all those words, which I have then cut, um, in order for me to work out what Kate is, like, where her headspace is, where her family's headspace is when the story begins. So, yeah, so I'm in that stage where I'm kind of telling myself the story. 
Yeah. yeah, I love that. And just a reminder, we have a few questions in the Q&A, but please write your questions, whatever it is, we'd love to hear from you, as well as comments. Danuka does not mind a compliment. Um, you can compliment her, tell her much how much you loved her book, whatever you like. So make sure you pop those in and we'll get to those in about 10 or 15 minutes if I ever stop talking, because I have a lot of questions still for you, Danuka. Now, just touching back and looping back a little bit to the creative process. I mean, creativity is a, a strange beast, isn't it? It's not like, you know, when you do your taxes, you go, I'm gonna go and sit down, I'm gonna do and finish my taxes, all right? As boring as that may be, you can do it, right? Because it's, you know, you do this and you do this and you press the button and you're done. Whereas with creativity, it's very different because there's a lot of thinking and there's a lot of writing that people never see and there's a lot of working things out and there's a lot of downtime where you're not actually typing, you're fixing or you're editing or you're thinking or you're writing drafts or some people, I don't know how you operate, you know, put post-it notes all over the wall. So creativity isn't one of those things where you can go, okay, going to be creative today. I mean, I did hear some research that says if you write at the same time every week or every day, your brain gets used to that and it has that thinking time for the 12 or hours or however long you leave it for and then your brain's ready to be creative. But you still can't force creativity. But with these deadlines now that you have for book two and then with book three, how are you coping with the creativity versus the deadline? Because the deadline needs to be there, but it's not always gelling with the creative brain is it yeah now it's interesting you say that I mean I, you know what you said about uh you know you're getting your brain used to a certain period in time because certainly I mean going back to the very first draft that I put down for the torrent you know that was done on I think it was a sat every Saturday of the week I think or every Sunday I can't remember which day but it was a day on the weekend where we went okay this is my day for writing and that's the day I would write and and I I have to say that during that entire seven months or whatever there was no Saturday or Sunday, whatever day it was, that I sat down and that nothing came out because it, that was what, you know, like I told my brain to do. So my brain was working during the whole week while I was looking after kids um, and it was getting that story organised for me so that when I sat down on that Saturday, it just all came out. You know, like it, I, I may have changed it all the, the next week, but it, it was there to come out, you know, like it was very much there for me. So, I mean, now, like I'm in a much, you know, very lucky position where I have far more time to dedicate to writing and now the kids are at school. So, um, so I have got into that routine where I literally get up in the morning, you know, the kids go to school and then I sit down and those three, four hours, that first kind of nine to 12, nine to one, like I do write, you know, like it's, uh, I mean, you know, some days you're absolutely right, like, not much will come out but but I am used to that now where I do use that time to write and 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 you know I heard someone say and I can't remember who it is but you know at the end of the day when someone's reading it they can't tell which paragraph was the bad writing day they can't tell that you know like it, it all kind of you know and eventually like the words words kind of add up and and, and you have something and so I mean, with the deadline, I am such a, I'm such a task focused person. I mean, that's like my entire career. Like I can't always a deadline. I mean, you know, if you're interesting at the end of the 12 months to see if I have missed the deadline, but you know, like uh, certainly that is not my intention to do that. You know, uh, like that has been my whole career of working to deadline. So I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not a, um, like, you know, I'm used to that in the sense that I know like, you know, uh, when that deadline is coming up and what I should be doing ahead of it. So I'm not scared of it, but I like, it's just that frustration in my own head that I, I know it's this, this slow end of the process where I am still working out the story. So it's not coming out as fast as I would like to. So, you know, there's that frustration. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about, you know, the, the reader can't sense when it was a bad writing day. I, when I was speaking to Jack Heath, there's been a you know, crime writer and children's writer he said something really interesting and I want to know if this is the same or different for you so he said when he starts writing and he's like this is so easy I'm having such a great easy day I'm just smashing out the words he'll he'll say when I go back to it, it's actually terrible and I chuck it out he said but whenever I'm struggling with a paragraph or a book or a passage or whatever and I'm struggling away and maybe I haven't written as many words as I want to but when it's a real challenge and a real struggle he said that's actually when I go back and my writing is at its best how have you found the struggle and the ease and then what comes from that? Yeah, right. Um, I guess, I don't know. I think I, as a personality type, I am quite dogged. You know, like I, 
won't let I mean so far anyway I haven't let anything really that beat me in that sense like I, I've just gone okay well that's the task I gave myself and it was you know even that first draft it was like well it was like a bet with myself to see if I could do it you know uh, but I would very much say that like uh, you know I find kind of that 80,000 mark point like that would be my absolute limit like I you know I find it very difficult I don't know how writers do it to write to 100,000 I find it really difficult to get beyond the 80,000 in fact I would probably be around the 79,000 mark and then cut 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 and I often write more because I know I'll be cutting it back down quite heavily because when I edit I cut I don't I very rarely add um so certainly I mean that's what I found in the second one anyway it was mostly cutting mostly cutting um you know sentences that weren't needed you know like over description you know um so yeah I mean in terms of the hard hardness like I guess I just kind of write through it like I I I sometimes I I you know you have these moments where for three hours you're fighting one paragraph but because you went through that your your unconscious brain is actually working on it you know so the next day when you come back it's there for you so you you had to go through those three hours or the four hours the day before where it wasn't working and it was literally like pulling teeth to get that one paragraph but it, it forced your mind into that space of working that problem out so then you know by the time you pick up the kids and do the lunches da, 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 and then you've gone through and watch netflix and you come back the next morning it's there for you you know so i think all those bits are necessary like it can't all be like an easy brilliant creative writing day i don't think because i, I don't think it works that way but we should do it. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah exactly. <laughs> and it's funny you say that. It is because, you know, the writing process is exactly like that. It's not, you know, you go to school, you get these marks, you go to uni, you get these marks, you get this job. But the writing process is never like that. You could write something for 10 years and never get published. Mm -mm. You could, you know, write. It's not that it doesn't have that sort of lockstep thing. So you have to love it. You know, you have to love what you're doing to be able to get through all those hard days and know that there may not be anything at the end of it. I mean, for you now, you've got the book deal. So you've got three books locked in, but there was a time for you where you were writing and writing and writing and struggling and with no promise of anything at the end. So I think, I think writing is, it's more than, it's almost a calling, you know, it's something that tugs at you and you have to do it. And you sort of have to come to terms with the fact well if I'm never published or no one reads this or no one wants this I still have to do it was that the case for you yeah absolutely I mean you know by the end of it you know there was pretty much a joke between me and my husband where I'll be like getting another email oh but oh there's another rejection you know like it was it was a running joke it became because I you know I mean I I, I joke about the fact that I have no publications to my um credit but it wasn't for the lack of trying you know? I mean, I was still putting short stories. I was, you know, writing pieces and, 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 and submitting it. I mean, it just wasn't sticking like, because, you know, there's like a million brilliant writers out there, you know? Um, so, you know, so it became a running joke about, oh, look, I've got another rejection. So yes, yeah, certainly, look, I mean, with writing and certainly, certainly with writing novels, uh, you know, it, it, certainly if your aim is publication or even if it isn't, like you've got to stick with that story for over like so many different drafts, you know, because it's such a long process. So even, even before you get to publication, you're probably revising and revising and revising. So if it's not a story you love or if it's not characters that you love, like you are reading this over and over and over and over again and, and trying to get it better and better and better. So if you're not dedicated and you're not able to read through your work again and try and step back from it and say okay and how can I improve it how can I improve it um yeah like it, it is kind of the wrong profession because like you do have to stick with these words for a very long time um like in saying that obviously you know there are incredible sort of uh actual you know uh, courses and things that you can actually do to work on your craft I mean I, I you know I, I think it is important as much as your financial capacity allows to work on your craft you know whether that be actual paid courses or you know listening to your podcast or you know listening to writing and book podcasts and see how other writers deal with the exact same issues you're trying to deal with and they will give you their processes and, and things that work for them but yeah it is absolutely key to kind of work on your craft um you know um and and I think have that discipline because 
as with anything, if there's if you don't do it, kind of walks in you, you know, like you lose, you lose it, you know, like I mean, you don't lose the, I guess, that core of talent, but you, you don't master it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you know, you get out of practice, mm. right? And you have to kind of almost relearn it again. So, you know, I mean, you have to have that dedication and as you say, love for it to kind of keep going back to it. Yeah. Someone said I read somewhere that you have to write a million bad words to write good words, which is a goal, but fairly depressing as well. Um, we're going to hit some questions, Danuka, and then I'm going to come back because I want to just, you know, we're at the bad festival, or, you know, bad crime here. So we should talk about crime, one of my favourite topics, uh, crime fiction, that is, not actual crime. Uh, but we're going to hear some questions for you um, and then we'll go back and I'm going to grill you a bit more. So we'll give you a rest. I know these questions might be really hard. Uh, we've got Joan, first book in the Banjo Prize. Congratulations. Looking forward to what's coming in the future. See, no expectation at all, Danuka. None. No, none at all. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and she also says, are any of your characters ever based on real people and how much research do you need to incorporate uh, to round out your characters? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, obviously there's autobiographical elements to Kate because, as I said, you know, certainly when I started writing, it wasn't for the purposes of getting publication. So it was, you know, I just wrote myself, like, you know, and, and but obviously now she has absolutely become her own person and to me, you know, she, she kind of lives this parallel kind of life in my head. But so, yeah, I would say there are, you know, those elements of myself absolutely in her, you know, um, and um, what was the other question? Research. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, so absolutely in terms of the research side of it, uh, like more the police side of it, I've been um, very lucky. We have a very uh, close family friend who is a um, criminal barrister and he also used to work for the New South Wales Police. So, um, so he very, uh, you know, generously kind of reviewed the whole manuscript and I also submitted the second manuscript to him before I submitted it to Harper Collins for him to do the to do the review uh you know to make sure that I got the police stuff right um yeah and and certainly I mean you know just the usual google research but uh you know I've been able to make some contacts uh you know sort of in, in sort of the forensic side as well so that you know to kind of get that help um for the second one <laughs> Um, yeah, so certainly, I mean, you, you kind of make those contacts as you go along and you kind of, uh, you know, get their help in reviewing those kind of technical sides for you. Yeah. Mm, very lucky to have that person to read the book. I love that. Everyone needs that person yes. that they can just go to. And I know, say, but he's mine. He's mine. Yeah, yeah. Read this book and <laughs> tell me what's wrong and what's yes, right. That's right. We've also got Imbi Neem. She says, hello, Danny. Hi, Imbi. Lovely to see you. Uh, now, she loved your book and I, she says, I loved listening to you talk about it. What has been the most surprising thing about the experience of getting published for the first time so far? Oh, wow. The first time. Um, I mean, there's just been so many kind of like blow your head moments like when they sent me like the books to sign, you know, in my front, front uh, lounge and I was like, oh, okay cool <laughs> that, that was very cool like that was like you know because you see that on Instagram like all the other like profit authors doing it and now they send it to me and I'm like oh okay and then I was like so worried about like the the, the ink leaching onto the second page and I was like putting a thing like a cardboard thing under the page and I was like so careful because <laughs> it was like oh god it felt like I was defacing these books rather than kind of signing my name um so, yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, and I think, you know, just the general, I mean, look, I think one of the loveliest things that has come out uh, from being a debut um, is a sort of the community I've built through Twitter in particular and through social media of other debut writers. And, and you know, I've talked about this before, but we have sort of like this debut book gang of the 2022, you know, class of 2022. And that has honestly been like a bit of a lifesaver because we we now have a whatsapp group and we just talk about our anxieties you know as as they happen so um and and sort of issues that have come up with you know whatever like you know disappointments of you know launches not happening or you know whatever like as in face-to-face -face launches I mean um you know and things like that and you just just that support network because we're literally going through the exact same thing at the exact same time and we're having the exact same anxieties and the the people who are like a month ahead can go actually this is what we did and you know you know what I mean and there's this advice there's this beautiful kind of network that we've built 
And like, honestly, I would say like they're like full on, they're now my friends. You know what I mean? It's this, it's this thing that starts on social media and then you end up with actual lifelong friends. And I, I, actually that has been one of the most amazing things about the whole book journey, but, you know, and certainly in this particular time as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we keep saying it, I say it every time I speak to someone, the book community is just the most supportive, encouraging community. And I think because it's such an isolating community as well, because, you know, when you're writing on your own and then you come out and you, you know, come together and then you can share all those challenges and all those celebrations. But I always say that if the world, the entire world was like the book community, we'd have, we'd, we'd be having a good time and we'd be having, you know, I've never known any sort of community to be as supportive and as encouraging and, you know, as authentic as this one. So I think, you know, we're all very lucky to be part of it. There's another question from Catherine and she asks, has your work in the environmental field influenced this book in any way or your writing? No, it's so funny. So many people ask me that, like, oh, your next book will be set in you know, the environment sector. And like literally in my head, that never occurs to me because to me, it's like, to me, that's work, you know? To for me to bring an environmental plot line into my into my fun will be like, why would I be doing that? You know, it literally never occurs to me. So I, you know, and people constantly say that and I and I'm like, uh, so far, no, I would have to say a definite no for any of the three plot lines, um, you know, not in, you know, I mean, apart from sort of in a very kind of very broad sense in terms of, I guess, the flood in terms of sort of broader environmental issues, but really not in any kind of um, specific, not in any intentional way anyway. Yeah. Mm, it's funny. It's you leave your work and your work and you compartmentalise the writing. <laughs> know though what will happen in the future but I like that and you do need a break from all those other little bits of your life isn't it and, and carve those different parts of your life absolutely let's talk a little bit about crime since we're here with bad crime you put on these wonderful events for book lovers and readers and writers and ourselves so I love crime crime is a genre that for me just has so much and I think it resonates with people because it has great characters and it has suspense and it has the puzzle you put together and it has empathy and great characters and you know it's not I was speaking to someone today about crime and it, it's no longer you know the dead girl in the bathroom in a lingerie you know and I'm so happy that we've moved beyond these stereotypes in crime which you definitely have with a torrent and so I think crime has resonated so much with people because you've got this huge continuum of you know thrillers and psychologicals and domestic and you know everything in between and so you can have these you know huge genre with everything in it and it just covers so much like it gives me everything when I read it you know I think that's why I love crime so much and I love solving the puzzle and I'm really happy when I solve the puzzle about 75 percent of the book I'm really happy when that happens which happened with yours by the way um <laughs> very satisfying but what is it you could write in any genre Januka so what is it about crime for you yeah it's interesting because I mean I think I always come back to I guess my love of reading crime so I literally it literally never occurred to me to write in any other sort of uh genre you know like I mean I you know e even my earliest memories of trying to think up ideas for this was always on the basis of a mystery or a, you know a twist or a whatever um it, it just never occurred to me to write in any other genre and and for me I mean I think you know crime you know as as a reader I think you know there is that pure escapist element of, of crime fiction, you know, and I've, and I've actually heard, this is a really great quote, which I'm stealing directly from Ashley Collegian Blunt, who I think in a recent, one of her recent podcasts, she was talking about this, of, of how, you know, you know, s certain kind of crime thrillers are very much, you know, are in that sense, pure fantasy in the same way that, you know, fantasy books are, because it is, you are asking to the reader to take a leap of faith with you, you know, to, to, to believe the fact that the maverick detective could do that over and over and over again and never get fired type thing. And, and you know, <laughs> or, the, or the detective can solve the mystery in, 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 you know, in seven days. And, you know, so there is a leap of faith and there is that pure escapist element in crime. Uh, crime fiction but what is also great about crime fiction is you can literally tackle any issue because you know you know everybody understands that 
any part of society can be can come into contact with the law or come into you know have a form of injustice played upon them so so you so in that sense you can literally take it to any part of society or any part of issue and obviously you know certain uh parts of society you know are more vulnerable to you know being in contact with the law and and those societal issues can be just as well explored you know and, and you know um you know, uh, sort of the new wave of sort of crime are doing exactly that, are exactly exploring, you know, things like, you know, uh, are getting into things like racism and, you know, uh, you know, the things that happen in, you know, structurally in those police forces and, and various societal issues. So, you know, cry, you know, you really have that almost that huge spectrum. There is literally something there for, for everyone. But what it does is it explores those issues in the form of a page turning, you know, th there is a puzzle at the end. So whilst, you know, so whilst you're in that familiar kind of genre, you know, you're, you're getting your, your fix, you know, you're getting your, your puzzle fix, you're getting your uh, tension fix. But there's all these other issues that you get, um, you, you can, uh, you know, bring into it at the same time. So, and very believably, because literally crime can affect anyone, you know, or injustice can affect anyone. So, yeah. Mm, I love that. I love the way you're saying that it does affect everyone. And I like the idea of it reflecting society. And I think crime does that so well. We've got another question before we wrap up very shortly from Flex, our friend Flex. Hey, Flex. Um, you were mentioning earlier about how a great part of crime was rediscovering the story on a revisit, you know, when you revisit your draft. Were there many moments in your story that surprised you in the edits or was it also deeply internalised? So when you revisit it, do you think, oh, wow, I didn't, was that, wow, how did I think of that? <laughs> or was it all quite planned? Yeah, look, I mean, there are those moments where, um, you know, certainly when there have been long gaps between sort of uh, going back to the manuscript and there was that moment when um, certainly between winning and getting to the structural edits for HarperCollins, there was quite a, you know, quite a few months. Um, and when I read it, there were certainly some bits that I went, oh, wow, that's, I'm very quite happy with that line. And there were other bits that I was just like, oh, bathed with absolute cringe, like shame that, oh, someone has read this. This is just so bad. Um, you know, and there was, there was certainly, I do remember, I think maybe it was December last year. No, not last year, sorry, the year before, uh, where I just kind of, ripped kind of basically like a uh, um, a chapter and a half where I entirely rewrote it because I was just so like oh my god how is this so bad you know so so it, like yeah so I think that distance is good because it absolutely makes you see your words as a reader and, and you can see the good as well as the bad and so um yeah so both those things happen <laughs> Mm, I love that. And it is, it's, you know, when you're writing a novel, particularly with 80,000 words, you are sort of taking a bit of your soul and putting it on the page. So you're feeling very, very vulnerable when you're doing that. Now, Jenica, this could be one of our last questions, depends on how long we talk, depends on when Catherine tells us to wind up. And I've always got questions up my sleeve, but I did want to get this one in, in case we got cut off. So, you know, you've written this wonderful crime novel and you've got the puzzles and you've got this amazing character breaking stereotypes. But as Ben Hobson said, you've got this wonderful relationship in there as well, which he was really rooting for the whole way, which was nice. <laughs> but if, if there's one thing, just one thing, if you had to pick that you would want the reader to leave after they've read your book and keep thinking about or keep exploring, what's the one thing you want to leave your reader with after they've read it? Um, yeah, I would say... I think the idea of sort of people not being sort of, you know, fully bad or fully good, you know, and that, that just there's so much grey in, in all of us. And I think if, if push came to shove, uh, you know, so, sometimes I think we get to be good because we have the privilege of being good. You know, we, we have the privilege of living lives that we're not fighting each day for for you know to feed our kids and to and to keep a roof over our heads and to you know to run away from people you know in war zone areas and things like that we have the privilege of being good you know you know and so so often like I have no idea how I would act if I was actually pushed into that corner um and, and you know and my my you know loved ones were were sort of threatened or whatever um and in circumstances and I also think that that split second circumstance where you have to make that decision right at that moment that's when it really counts it's not when you can judge on Twitter 
like, you know, two weeks later, well, if I was in that situation, I would have done something different. I mean, how would you know, you know? And I think it's, so I've tried to, you know, in all of the characters, I've tried to give them some gray, like they are not all good. There are certainly things that, you know, Kate does that are, you know, you know, you know, may not certainly uh, be the best for her or her family. Um, you know, so I think I'm hoping that what you get is, you know, that appreciation for what's behind the mask of sort of quiet, ordinary people and, mm. and how that grey exists for all of us. Yeah, yes. I, I really love the way you said that, Danuka, because we have the privilege of being good. And I think that's such a powerful statement because we do. And then, you know, you think, oh, I wouldn't do that, but we wouldn't do that because we have a choice. You know, when you're not faced with a choice, that's when you might make those decisions where you may not have when you're in that privileged position. So I really love that. And I think that's a really great place to leave it. And it's food for thought. And I'm actually going to go away and think about that a bit more too. <laughs> so I like the idea of the grey, but I like the idea of, I don't know if I've ever, ever had it articulated like you said, you know, we have the privilege to be good. So I think that's really important for us to take home. Now, Catherine is back. So I think she's going to wrap us up yeah. now. But I, just I am going to wrap you. this up much as I would like to carry on <laughs> listening to it. And I love that idea of, as you said, um, Danny, that idea of choice and, and the idea that, I mean, there's a choice that comes, well, at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. Well, I won't say that anymore, anymore, because I don't want to give anything away. But that person who made that choice, not a good choice, probably didn't know that it would be made by them if that situation hadn't occurred. So there's a lot of serendipity as well, I think. You know, you suddenly, something happens and you go, right, yes. And who knows what we'd do? Who knows what any any one of us would do? And um, I, I think this, this raised a lot of those questions. And we at BAD absolutely agree with what you're saying, that crime covers everything. Everything at, at its best, it covers it has a story and has the, the biting of the lip and the tension and the can I work this out, but it also has everything about the way we live, everything about current society. I'm reading my first crime book set in COVID. And that is fascinating. Wow. I've read a UK one, which is, and everything was slightly different there. So it's like your experience, but not your experience. So I think that's a, a great, a great thing about, um, about crime fiction. And I recommend this book to everyone. You'll see bits of yourself and you'll see things you might not like about human behavior, which we always do in, in crime fiction. But it's, it's, a very, it's a very warming book at the same time. And as you said, Danny, it's very real and very good to see that Kate, the, 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 the main police detective protagonist, uh, she's a real person and she's juggling with all sorts of things. And it was, it was very refreshing to have all those things mentioned. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, that was really great. If you don't yet have a copy of The Torrent, you can get one from wherever you buy your books mostly, or go to our Booktopia page. I've actually just checked it and it's, it's your book's not up there quite yet, but it will definitely be there very soon. So if it's not there, just hold on till tomorrow, copy that, copy that link and use it tomorrow and you will be able to, to get the book. And um, I've actually have read an early, um, one of those early copies, you were readers' copies. And I got to the, I looked at the end of my new one. I thought, I didn't read that chapter. What I didn't get that. And suddenly I realized it was that I thought, what, what what's happening? So there is a next book, and I can tell you, having read the first chapter, it's pretty good. So uh, there's a lot to look forward to. Thank you so much. And in terms of bad, there's a lot to look forward to next month. We've got, um, as I told Danny and Danuka, we've got Linda Laplante, that another woman who writes women and has been writing women for like 30 years, 40 years, really, really well. So Widows, which was a great concept, a great television series and, and also books. Um, prime suspect and you know all about Jane Tennyson so she's going to be talking about her new book so that is really exciting and look at the Bad Sydney website to see a bit more look I'm sure everybody's enjoyed the evening as much as I have thank you so much Danny thank you so much Danuka and we look forward to your next book yay thank you so thank much you Catherine very I so much. appreciate it thank you not at all goodbye everyone <laughs>